Hey YouTubers, welcome back to Donut Boy 73. Today is another episode of Small Engines Questions and Answers for Friday, January 20th. And it's been pretty cold here in Ontario, Canada. We had minus 21 degrees Celsius last week and this weekend around minus 20. It's warming up a bit right now. It's not as cold, but it sure feels like winter this week. We haven't had much snow though this year. Usually we have a lot more snow than this. And from what I understand, it's been the same thing across most of Ontario this year. And the other day I had a YouTuber from Australia email me telling me that it's 40 degrees Celsius over there. That's hot. And before I start off today, I've got an older snowblower outside. It's leaking a bit of gas from the carburetor. It does have a Tecumseh engine. And I'm just going to show it to you guys because a lot of people email me telling me that their carburetor is leaking and they're not sure what to do. And here's the blower here. It's an older Craftsman snowblower made by Noma. And here's the Tecumseh engine. And as you can see underneath the bowl, there's a steady drip of fuel here coming from underneath the screw. And if you have this problem on your snowblower, what you need to do is to buy a new carb kit. You're going to get all the o-rings for it, especially the one for the bowl over here. I would also suggest that when you rebuild the carburetor that you replace the bowl as well because it's pretty cheap. If you want to make sure you have no problems whatsoever, replace the float inside as well. Now this leak here is due to the o-rings here being worn out and possibly the bowl nut gasket over here. Now sometimes people prime their snowblower too much and it will leak a bit of gas. This is a different issue. This carburetor here leaks even if you do not use it. Just sitting in the garage it will drip, a steady drip. And I also have other videos that show how to repair these carburetors as well. If you have this problem, I'll just post the link to the video series underneath this video. In my next question, a YouTuber asked me, what's the best amperage to use when you charge a lawn tractor battery? Now this information will apply to any battery you charge. What I recommend when charging your batteries is always use the lowest amp setting you have on your charger. Now this charger here has a 50 amp for when you want to boost the car. It's got 10 amp and it's got 2 amp. Now I always use the lowest amperage on my charger. Apparently it's better for the battery. And when I have a 1 amp setting then I use that. Like this little trickle charger over here, it's only 1 amp. But if I'm working on a lawn tractor and I want to get the battery charged up pretty quick, then I'll go to 10 amps. But only for short periods. So again, the lowest amperage I use is when I'm going to leave a battery charge for a long period of time. Now that's what I've been told by a lot of mechanics. I'm not exactly sure why you should use the lowest amperage setting on your charger. But I'm sure some of you guys watching out there know exactly why. If you want, you can comment below this video. We would all appreciate that. Another question I often get is, what's the best way to repair a flat tire on a snowblower? What I recommend is if you have a flat tire on your snowblower, just get a tube for it and install it yourself or take it to a local tire shop. When you buy a brand new snowblower, it's not going to come with tubes in the tire and over time they can start leaking air because they're tubeless tires. And from my experience, I always find that if you put a tube in your snowblower tire, it's never going to go flat again. You're done for good. I've noticed sometimes people just pop the bead, then reinflate the tire, and sometimes over time it starts to leak again. That's why I always recommend to use a tube. My next question is in regards to the small Tecumseh motors on smaller snowblowers. Now this little engine here today is a 4 horsepower, so what I'm going to talk today about is the 4 to 5 horsepower Tecumseh engines. People often email me telling me that they're really hard to start even if they've done everything to the carburetor that needed to be done. What I'm going to tell you today is if you've done all the things that can be done to the engine. For example, the carburetor, you've got good spark and everything else, but your engine is still hard to start. So the answer to this question is that often I find with these smaller engines, specifically the Tecumseh engines on snowblowers, is that they will get low compression over time. And what often happens is I have to take the engine apart, take the head off, take the exhaust valve and shave it down a bit so that it will shut tight again. Oftentimes it's just a leaking exhaust valve that I find will cause the engine to have low compression. And if you have low compression it's going to be harder to start. It's going to have less power and it's not going to run as good as it did when you first got it. Oftentimes I can tell it's got low compression just by pulling on the pull cord. And if I don't feel much resistance, I know that it's time to give it a good valve job. I've done a lot of valve jobs on these little Tecumseh motors. It just seems that people sometimes overwork them. They'll buy the smallest snowblower because it's the least expensive, 
but yet use it to do a very large driveway. I find that happens a lot. And therefore, because it's a smaller engine, it works much harder than it should, and it's gonna wear out a little bit quicker. And what happens is the weak points in the engine will show up. And in this case, on these smaller engines, like I said, it's usually a leaking exhaust valve. But when I do a valve job on these engines, I'll do both valves, the intake and the exhaust. I don't really bother sometimes taking a compression test because sometimes they have an automatic decompressor. That's why I don't rely just on the compression test to know if it needs a good valve job. To me, the diagnosis becomes part of a combination of symptoms and also how much power the engine has compared to when it was newer. The next question that a YouTuber emailed me a while ago is that he has a concrete saw, it's got no spark, and he's wondering what could be the issue. Well, usually it ends up being the ignition coil. And it'll be the same idea if you have a chainsaw, it's pretty well the same principle, a two-cycle motor, and it's only got an ignition module for the spark. But before you spend a lot of money to replace an ignition module, you should check the small wire that goes to the coil and the ignition switch. Sometimes it can end up being an electrical issue, like just a wire that's shorting where it shouldn't. It could be the gap between the coil and the flywheel isn't proper. So there's always a possibility that it could be something much cheaper to repair than replacing the whole ignition module. So make sure to check all the wires first. You can also disconnect the small switch wire from the ignition module and then try it because that bypasses the switch and everything. Be careful if you do this because you will have no shutoff switch. And if you disconnect the switch wire and you've got spark, then you know it's an electrical problem, which sometimes can be harder to find, but much cheaper to repair if you do it yourself. And a very basic thing to do before you do any of this is just replace a spark plug. Make sure you've got the right spark plug number for your equipment, because sometimes it could make a difference. You could have weak spark if you don't have the right spark plug. And sometimes you never know, even if you have a brand new spark plug, it could be defective. A question I received a little while ago from another YouTuber is he asked me if all keyways come off of crankshafts. Well, 99% of the time they do. Here's a crankshaft from a motor that I have in my hands and you can see the hole here for the keyway and here's the keyway it goes in here maybe tight. This is not the actual keyway for this engine but I'm just showing you this as an example. If it were on the motor the keyway would be much shorter and yes you can get them off by using a flat screwdriver or a chisel and just punch them out. Even the small keyway over here would come out. You could use a screwdriver and a hammer and just tap it out. So if you need to remove the keyway, don't be afraid to do so. You're gonna to need to do this, especially if you're gonna replace the engine crankshaft seals because they need room to get out. On some newer chainsaws though, the keyway will be fused right into the flywheel. In that case, you cannot remove it from the flywheel. If the keyway breaks, then you would most likely need a new flywheel for your chainsaw. Some older chainsaws come with a separate keyway that separates from the flywheel and the crankshaft, but on most new modern saws, the keyway is built right into the flywheel. So be very careful when you remove the flywheel from your chainsaw, and especially when you put it back on, make sure that the nut is on there really tight. Because if the flywheel gets loose, it will shear that keyway, and then your flywheel is no good anymore. So that'll be about it for today. I gotta get back to work in the shop. And I want to thank all the other viewers who commented on subjects that I wasn't too sure about. It does help myself and all the other viewers as well. So have yourselves a great weekend and we'll see you next Friday.